Lord and our Father, we bless your name tonight because we come to your table again to partake of the bread of life. And we're asking you to break this bread of life to every one of us and feed us so that we can grow up spiritually in Jesus' name. Amen. We know that it's only as we eat and as we digest that we'll grow in various ways we ought to grow. And we're asking as a corporate body, as a church body, that will eat and digest your word and grow thereby in Jesus' name. Amen. Help every one of us too, so that by the study and the reading and partaking of your word, every one of us will grow as we ought to grow. In Jesus' name we pray. We've been studying from the Acts of the Apostles and it has been an exciting, inspiring study. As we have gone through chapter by chapter and verse after verse, and there is so much in the Acts of the Apostles because, as I told you before, this is the authentic history of the early church. And, uh, you know, as you study about the early church, you see that early church moving from a very small number to a very large number. And there is a problem in the church world today. You know, in many churches, Orthodox churches, Protestant churches, Catholic churches and um, indigenous churches, uh, churches serving their headquarters overseas and churches that just started in Nigeria here, there is a particular problem and uh, many pastors that I have discussed with, we have, um, we have seen the importance of administration and organization in the church. And um, some pastors have been kind enough and they have been humble enough to be able to confess that when the church administration and organization is weak, that church will be weak. That it doesn't matter how much you know, it doesn't matter how much you pray, it doesn't matter how much you are putting into the church work if you do not have biblical church organization. You are not likely to be able to actually grow as the early church. But on church organization, there are two extremes. One extreme says that there should be no organization at all. In fact, you know, there are people that believe that a church should not have a name. That once you have a name of any sort, an address of any sort, and you even have, a, you know, a postal address with the name of the church, that it is not proper, it is not right. They contend that because the church is an organism, it's a living entity, and as a living entity, our head is in heaven. And uh, church officers, church workers, and uh, everything that is uh, meant to bring the church in order, that it is totally wrong. And uh, you'll be surprised there are some people like that in Nigeria here. And I've, I've run into them sometimes, and they say, well, there should be no organization at all. No time you know, we ought to say this ought to be done, this ought not to be done. We just, everybody should just move in the flow of the Spirit of God. And as the Spirit is leading everyone, everyone will be acting. That's one side. Another side says, well, the church should be organized. And it should be well organized so much that the organization of the church should compare with business organization. That, you know, the drop of the pin and the stroke of the pen, everything should be, you know, should be well described. The job description of everyone, the way you look up, the way you look down, the way you stand up, the way you close your eyes, and the times you sit down, the time you kneel down, everything should be orderly and just put uh, into a particular compartment. And, you know, it's so watertight in organization that the Holy Ghost couldn't move in at all to be able to shake everything together and develop the church and make the church grow. You know, there is a type of superstructure in church and organization that ties the hand of everybody, that ties the heart of everybody, that you are not able to move to the right or left. And that superstructure just hinders and restricts the Holy Ghost from doing what he ought to do. So, between those two extremes, those who say there is no church organization at all. Everything should just, you know, move on as the Holy Ghost is leading. And the other people that say that the church organization should be so strict and so structured that the Holy Ghost should not have a free hand to move at all. Between those two extremes is the middle line of church biblical organization. And the Bible does say that God is not the author of confusion. So there is organization. 
The Bible makes us to understand you do all things decently and in order. So there is organization. And as you look at Israel in those days, now if you have time to study the organization and the system of the Old uh, Testament um, assembly, you'll find that they were even told where to build the tabernacle and where the different tribes, the 12 tribes, where they were to settle down and the new when to move out and when to come in, the new how to get everything done and whenever they were going to move forward, maybe they were marching through Jordan or marching through anywhere, there was such an organization that everything was orderly. Now, as you come into the um, rank and file of the disciples at the time of Jesus Christ, Number one, we know this, that there were times of doing whatever they were to do. And that is organization. Uh, you know, when we talk about organization, you may not understand. Once a particular body of believers wants to say you are going to have a, a Bible study every Monday, already that's organization. Because you are putting a day and a time to your meeting. That's organization. Once you say that every Thursday at 5.30... This is what you will do. And these are the zones that will be present. And these are the zones that will stay behind. That's organization already. And uh, you know, in the, with the disciples of Jesus Christ, they even had a treasurer. That's organization. And whenever they were to give money to the poor, they knew who was to do that. That is organization. And whenever the Passover was to be taken, he will send just two people. He gave a particular job, a job description to some of his disciples. And he told them what to do, at what time to do it, and how to do it. That is organization. And you know, when the Holy Ghost fell on, uh, in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, was there organization? Oh yes, because you know, the Holy Ghost came on them. And you know what we're told? We're told of the place of meeting. They were in the upper room. And we're told that there were 120 of them. There was somebody taking the number. There was an usher there telling us that 120 people were present. And do you know that when uh, uh, 3,000 were converted, instead of just saying, you know, we preach the word and it doesn't matter how many people were converted, they told us 3,000 people. Somebody was doing the counting. And you know after those 3,000 were converted, they knew when they were all baptized in water because a time was set and the water baptism was conducted and they knew when everybody had been baptized in water. And you know what? They were told that they were breaking bread from house to house. Now you think about that. They had the addresses of the house fellowships. They knew that at this particular house, we can break bread there. That other house, we're not using that as yet. They knew which house they were to go to. And we're told that God was adding to the church every day, such as should be saved. They knew the names and the numbers of the people that were coming to the Lord every time. My brother, my sister, that is what we call organization in the church. And um, small churches have a type of organization. And large churches have a type of organization. And uh, for the brief moment we have um, this evening, we've been on this Acts chapter 6. And all I want you to see tonight is the organization of the early church. Now, we make a serious mistake when moderately sized churches copy large churches in details of administration and organization. You know, there are people, and um, understand me, I'm not speaking against anybody. We love everybody coming here. And uh, there are some pastors of other churches coming here. And we enjoy your coming here. If there is any way we can help, if there is anything you can learn about what God is doing with Deeper Christian Life Ministry, I'm telling you, we're so delighted and we're so excited that we're learning something so as to be able to use in your church. But listen to me. There are people that come in here and uh, they say, well, we will learn about the administration, organization in Deeper Christian Life Ministry. Well, that's all right. But you understand that there are differences of operations and there are differences of uh, diversities of manifestations. And uh, if you do not understand that you cannot administer, organize a small church as a large church, you know, there will be difficulty. Let me give you this illustration. Suppose you are involved with people who want to just capture a particular city in the army. And uh, you've seen the organization with Joshua 
and you've seen that Joshua, by the word of the Lord, collected all the people together, and he told them, march, march around. And six days, they, march, they marched around once a day. And on the seventh day, they marched seven times. And they shouted at the end of it. And then you went back to your own camp as the captain of the host, and you said, now I've gone to land administration and organization. I was just in Joshua's camp. And you know, six days, they marched around once a day. And on the seventh day, they shouted. And so we are going to do the same thing. You know, if you use that strategy in trying to capture AI, you'll be defeated. Because they didn't do that when they got to AI. That is spirit-led organization. So you see, when you come in here, you might feel that, you know, we just copy what they're doing in deeper life. And you transport this particular system and organization to another place. And it doesn't work. But you know, it was only once that they went around a particular city like that. And they shouted and the walls came down. But you know that when they went to the, the next town and they wanted to capture, they waited on the Lord. They wanted to know because they made their mistake. But later they came back to the Lord and they wanted to know what they must do. And the Lord gave them another strategy. All I'm saying is this. A pastor of a moderately sized church, a pastor of a small church, cannot uh, you know come to this place and they uh, say well everything they're doing here i'll borrow it and i'll go and use it in our church and will be as large as deeper life my brother my sister it's not like that it doesn't work like that the organization of a small church is different from the organization of a large church now listen to me there's another mistake people make now you come in here you are going to a church before and that church they were just 200 or 300 and in that church, they had a particular type of organization, uh, just with 200 to uh, 300 people. And now you have been converted, and you have been, you have gone into some doctrine, and you have been sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, and you are now a member of Deeper Christian Life Ministry. And you come into this church, and you know this church is uh, all of us together on Sunday. All the three services were more than generally 25,000 worshippers and members. And you know, you are coming from a background of 200, 300 people. And then you begin to say, well, they don't organize this church as my former church. You should understand that there must be a difference. Because you know, the church you are coming from is a small church. And this one is a large church. And therefore there is a difference. But wait, wait a minute and listen to me. You know, we have uh, some of our members. And these are members, they have been here for a long time and they were converted 1974 1975 when we were just um, you know 100 250 400 and there was a type of organization we had at that time and now they have traveled out they may travel out to kenya travel out to zambia travel out to zimbabwe travel out to america or travel to london and now they come on holidays and they come to fellowship with us they're still with deeper life they're still children of god and we're still all together and, but you know you know the difference they left deeper life at Lagos when we were just maybe 500 or just 2,000 or just 3,000 and now they are in another place and they may even be working with deeper Christian life ministry and in that place they are just building up and they are just building up and they are just in that other place 100, 150 or 200 and the administration of deeper life in that place is like the administration of deeper life 1974, 1975 in Lagos because that was when we were small. Now they are small. Then they come to Lagos and you see that the administration in Lagos at the headquarters is, you know, is uh, something a little bit different. You know, they can make two mistakes. One mistake, they can say, well, deeper life is changing. Pay attention. The doctrine is not changing. Christ is still the head. We're still getting saved. We're still getting sanctified. We're still being baptized in the Holy Ghost. We're still being healed by the power of God. By his tribes, we're still healed. And we're still studying the word of God. But you know, the structure, the outward structure is changing because it's a large church. And some of these are workers and missionaries. They may misunderstand and say, well, I'm so sorry for deeper life in Lagos because you know, they are changing everything. Because they don't understand that there is a difference between the organization of a small church and a large church. Or the other mistake they can make is this. They can say, well, 
our headquarters is now having this type of organization, administration, and they go back to Kenya or to Zimbabwe or to Zambia or to wherever they are posted and they change everything and they organize a hundred member church as we organize a 25,000 member church and it will fail. So you see, that's why we study the Bible. And that's why tonight, in the brief moment we have before us, I want to talk to you about biblical church organization. And um, in biblical church organization, you are very attentive to the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is leading. And as the Holy Ghost is revealing the needs, then you are bringing in the workers to meet up those needs. You know, the early church expanded the administrative network according to the needs of the church. The, the needs enlarged, then the administration expanded. The Holy Spirit revealed a need and workers were prayerfully selected to meet those needs. If the needs were temporary, temporary workers were chosen. If the needs were permanent, permanent workers were chosen. And so in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, I want to talk to you on the reason, the requirements, the roster, and the results. The reason for the administration, the requirements for the workers, the roster, the people that were chosen, and the result, the growth of the church after the new administrative setup came. And uh, you, need, you need to understand this because as a member of this church, uh, we have studied the Bible and our organization is just following after the biblical pattern. Now, let's see the reason why. In um, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason, it is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Look up at me here. You know, in either the reason in the church, the distribution of food, uh, was still being done but not in a perfect way because the congregation had become so large and you know while the apostles were preparing their messages and waiting on the Lord in prayer and uh, taking care to minister to the sick they were unknowingly overlooking unknowingly uh, just forgetting some aspects of the work and while it's true that the inner man was being fed the outer man was not being fed and because of hunger biting the people in their stomachs they started grumbling and murmuring and, uh, you know, the Grecians, the people in the congregation, they felt the need before the apostles saw the need. Uh, you know, those are two different stages in the church. Sometimes the membership will feel the need before the leadership will see the need. And when the feeling and the seeing come together, a solution will come out. And so you see, the people that felt the need as they spoke out, even though they did not speak in the proper way because they murmured and grumbled, which I've already told you it's not right, but they felt the need and they expressed the felt need. And after they felt the need and they expressed it, the apostles saw the need. Now, as a pastor, your ears must be attentive. To the feeling of the need in the congregation. As a zonal leader, you know, we cannot say we have started our fellowship system, everything is going on well. You understand that your zone was about uh, just 300 when we started. Now your zone is about 1,000. And if you are zonal leader, if your ears are not attentive, you will not see the need. And if you don't see the need, when the feeling and the seeing do not match together, there will be no solution for the problem. And so, you know, the apostles saw the need that the, that the uh, Grecian believers had been feeling within them. And because of that, they said, you know, it's not reasonable that we leave the ministering of the world and then begin to serve tables. That's the reason for the expanded network of the administration and the organization at this time. So, uh, they brought out a, so a solution in verse 3 and verse 4. Wherefore, brethren... Look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer 
and to the ministry of the word. You know, you know what that is? In economics, we call that the division of labor. You know, the work was expanded. And because of the expansion of the work, they now are going to, you know, just distribute the work and we're going to, you know, make the work, the job load or the job description to be very clear to each one. And he said, we'll lean heavily on this other side of the world. The ministration of the word, the ministration in prayer, the study of the word, the waiting upon the Lord, uh, will settle on that. And then we're going to choose seven men. And these seven men will be able to take care of the needs of the church. Now listen to me. These workers were not there. They were not chosen when they were only 3,120. Even when they were 8,000, these workers were not chosen, but now uh, church authorities, or sorry, um, Greek authorities and uh, theologians have estimated that the church at this time had risen to the number of about 30,000 in Jerusalem alone. And because of that, there were needs now that were not present there before. You know what? Uh, sometimes you as a zonal leader, area leader, house fellowship leader, or even the coordinator, if you do not understand that as the church is expanding, we have new sets of workers that we may not be having before, uh, you won't understand. You'll think, well, we've been doing it this way before, and that's the way we're going to ever continue. And you know... Uh, as you are a leader of a large church and you are a prayerful person and you are studying the Bible you will just begin to see it because the Lord will be leading you as the church is expanding then uh, the network of organization also will be expanded so they said they were going to choose seven men uh, you've seen the reason for the change in organization and I'll give you the requirements what were they looking for as they were going to choose the new set of workers to take care of the newly discovered needs in the church. What were the requirements? It's in verse 3. I've told you the reason now we go to the requirements. Acts 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men. That's the first qualification. We're going to choose some people to take care of the work, but listen to me. They are not going to advertise in the newspapers. They are not going to say now, uh, we need those who have uh, studied business administration. We need those who have studied, uh, you know, science. We need those who have uh, studied uh, processing data. We need those who have studied computer science to come in and help us. Because, you know, the church is very large and we want to be able to do distribution of the daily food, uh, you know, to the people. No, they were not going to have strangers. They were going to have men from among you. That's the first qualification. You know, if you don't understand that, many, many churches have ruined themselves because they just uh, bring in people. They bring in people from uh, outside. Uh, they can bring in somebody that will uh, be an associate pastor. He's not really a member of that church. He has not been converted there. He has not been worshipping with them. But, you know, they feel that they have heard about him. He has, uh, you know, uh, LLD, PhD, UMD, TLD, everything anyways D. And because of the DDD, whatever it means, they say, oh, you are just the right person for our church. Come and be an associate pastor. My brother, my sister, it doesn't work like that. Choose out men. The first qualification, it must be among you. It's not the science, it's not the English, it's not the theology, it's not the grammar. It is to be a man from among you. That's the first thing. And you know, that's why, you know, sometimes uh, people come to the pastor here. And they say, well, I've been a Christian. And, uh, you know, we just like to become full-time workers uh, with deeper Christian life ministry. I said, I'll say it's impossible because you don't know deeper life. You don't fellowship with deeper life. Just coming from outside and, you know, coming to just tell, give us theory. And we don't know your life as such. We don't know how you live. So the very first qualification is, must be men from among you. Now, look at that verse 3 again. And it says, men of honest report. That's character, that's integrity, that's behavior, and that is the very life of the individual. That's the second qualification. Number three, must be men full of the Holy Ghost. That is something. And number four, they will be men that are full of wisdom. One, men from among you. 
two, men of honest report, and three, men full of the Holy Ghost, and four, men that are full of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this work. Now, let me quickly run with you. Through these qualifications, and um, my brother, my sister, we can all be useful in the house of God. And I am looking for the time when you, sitting down there, will come to the level where the Lord will, will pick you up and will, will just empower you and will give you more and greater responsibilities. And I know the Lord is going to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. But uh, you know what? We are first of all a baby before we become a man. We are first of all going to walk with your two legs before the children of God, before you walk with your hand, with your two hands before the children of God. And you are going to sit down in the pew, listening to the word of God, before you stand on the pulpit, before you address the children of God. But you know there are people who are in a hurry. They do not want to sit before they stand. They do not want to sit down listening to the word of God before they stand preaching the word of God. They do not want to sit down feeding on the word of God among the congregation before they stand up and feeding the people of God with the bread of life. But you know, you sit before you stand. You feed among the people before you feed the people. And you walk with your two legs, walking in honesty of life before you work with your hands in service to the body of Christ. So let me go through with you. And uh, you must be patient. You know, if we're not patient, we ruin ourselves. We destroy ourselves. And I've seen people in deeper Christian life ministry, a few of them, not many, just a few of them. And they have been impatient and they have run away. They say, yes, I want to preach. I wa you are going to preach. You are going to preach. Preaching is there. Preaching is waiting for you. But you know, uh, be patient. But you know, I've seen people that said, I want to preach, I want to sing, I want to write, I want to do this, I want to do that. But they are not patient. And they have gone away. And uh, you know, right now, they are not doing anything. A few times, uh, I see them and I say, my brother, why not come back? We're waiting for you. And uh, one brother who saw me, you know, he said, I want to come back, but if I come back, uh, will you receive me back? I said, the church is not mine. The church belongs to every one of us. Once you come back, you become one of us again. But, you know, be patient. When you run away like that, before you come back, your own converts are already teaching and they're already preaching. They are, your converts are becoming zonal leaders before you come back. Whereas if you have waited only three months, only six months, only one, even if you have to wait for seven years, what does that matter? If you can only be patient, preaching, if God is calling you to preach, you are going to preach in Jesus' name. Amen. But you know, if we just uh, become impatient, we can ruin ourselves. Now, let me talk to you about these requirements, the qualifications, the things that were required. Number one, men from among you. Follow me. Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. Verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people. Uh, you see, uh, the father-in-law was counseling Moses. And he said, uh, you need organization. You need administration. And you will need more workers to be able to handle the work along with you. Because if you do it yourself alone, you'll just destroy and kill yourself. So, choose men. But who are the men that will be chosen? Notice this. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people. You know, that's the same qualification. Out of all the people. In Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. I'm reading there from verse 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren. You see that? You know, right from the beginning, if you are very uh, vigilant in the scriptures, you'll see that uh, postgraduate strangers 
are not brought into the church just because they've gone to America, they've gone to Canada, or they've gone to Britain to get, um, you know, a postgraduate in theology. That doesn't mean that they just come into the church and become pastors in the church. They must be men from among you. And I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. And I'm reading from verse 18. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tent, and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded upon her own eve, and the pilot shall remain after the manner thereof. And, uh, listen to this, out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of them that make merry and I will multiply them and they shall not be few and I will also glorify them and they shall not be small their children also shall be as aforetime and their congregation shall be established before me I, and I will punish all that oppress them and their nobles shall be of themselves their nobles the officers, the church workers, the people that rule, the people that help in any part of the church organization administration, their nobles shall be of themselves and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them. And I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his search to approach unto me, says the Lord, and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. So you see all through the Bible, you can see the qualification. Uh, there must be men from among you. I'm reading from Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 21. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, Unto, the same, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. You know, all through, you can see both in the Old and the New Testament, that the first qualification is that you are not a secret disciple. Uh, you know, there are people, you, you question them, brother, sister, why are you not um, one of the workers? Well, they have not chosen me. Well, uh, have you been among them? Have you been moving in and out among the children of God? Or are you just a secret disciple? You know, you say, you hold on to yourself. You'll not discuss your life, your problem, your plan, your, your program with anybody. You just go on your own way as a, you know, as a lone ranger. You know, that's not good. And if you continue like that, it will be a hindrance unto you. No matter the spiritual gifts you have, no matter the talents you have, the very first qualification that the church will be looking for is that is a man, is a woman among us. Number two, in Acts chapter 6, I'm looking at verse 3, the second requirement. Chapter 6, verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report honest report that's talking about integrity character reputation transparency in your life that's talking about your change of life that's talking about your moral standard that's talking about the lack of uh, you know there is no hypocrisy in your life at all and you know everybody can see through you the people who have lived with you they can see that you are honest and you have integrity come back to exodus chapter 18 and i'm still reading from verse 21 exodus chapter 18 verse 21 moreover thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear god men of truth hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Doesn't that look like the house fellowship system? Rulers of thousands in the zone, rulers of just hundreds in the area, and rulers of just fifties or tens in the, in the house fellowship. Uh, you know, uh, you, you divide into the various compartments and uh, you broaden the organization and according to the various ability of each one, you are able to give them the work they ought to do. And in verse 22, let them judge the people at all seasons. 
and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee. You wonder why, uh, you know, sometimes the zona leader will give you a card and say, that problem is above me. That's the reason why. The small matters, the ordinary matters, the one, the run-of-the-mill matters. You know, the zona leaders, uh, you know, they, they handle that. But when it comes to complications and restitution, complications in marriage matters. Well, they give you a card so that you can see the pastor himself or the, you can see the coordinator himself. Now, and in verse 22, you know what it says? It, it says here that, let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so that it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. And so uh, you can see very clearly the administration, the organization, but you know, the important thing here is that they must be men of honesty. In First Timothy chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest they fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. In Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. You know, uh, they do not uh, just have, I told you, a stranger, a postgraduate stranger, a theological stranger from another city, from another environment. They ordain them elders in every city, as I appointed thee. But what are the qualifications? If any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop, don't let that word confuse you, it has told you in verse 5, it's just an elder, and the Greek word not translated into English is just called bishop. You know, some people think that you become greater when you answer reverend so and so. And, uh, you know, some sometimes even call me reverend Kumui. I don't know about that. But, you know, and, and somebody wrote me, and you know what he wrote at the back? He said, Bishop Kumui. And he thought he was promoting me. Well, I'm just Brother Kumui. Verse 7, for a bishop, an elder, a worker in the church, must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. That is, it's not covetous because of money but a love of hospitality, a love of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exalt and to convince gainsayer. You see, they required honesty and a good character. And you know, if you say you are saved, you must be a new creature, as you know, we emphasized yet yesterday in the worship. Now, the, the third qualification, it says they must be men full of the Holy Ghost. Men full of the Holy Ghost. You know, they had all been filled with the Holy Ghost. But now, they were looking for men who remained full of that same Holy Ghost. And to remain full, we must be constantly revealed, refilled at the divine fountain through prayer, through faith, through obedience, even in small matters, through study of the word of God, and also faithfulness in all things. And uh, sometimes we say, how will I know if I am full of the Holy Ghost? Now, you are saved, number one. When you are saved, you are born of the Spirit. Then you are sanctified. That means um, you are cleansed, you are separated, and uh, the word of God has, you know, just uh, set you apart in a holy life. And the Adamic nature is taken away from, then you are baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But that doesn't mean that you are full of the Holy Ghost uh, every time because you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You see, you must remain full. But if you are leaking, uh, have you ever seen uh, a pot that uh, you just fill that pot with water and it is very full, but you didn't know that there was a crack? just on the side or just in the bottom and you know that crack 
is uh, making the water to leak out and by the time you come back about seven hours later you know that all the water is gone out because there was a crack you know what after you are baptized in the holy ghost if you have a crack cracking jokes Oh, you know, all the time, it's just laughter and the cracking of jokes. You are never, never serious. You just talk and talk and talk and talk. You'll be a leaking vessel. And when they want to choose the people that are still full of the Holy Ghost, the crack and the cracking of jokes has made all the water, all the Holy Ghost to leak away. You know, you'll remember something. That was a man that was, you know, just filled with the Holy Ghost. And that Holy Ghost will come upon him. And it will work in mighty ways. But you know... He kept on talking and talking and talking and talking. And there was a crack in his life until the Lord had departed away from him. And when Delilah said, eh, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, he, he rose up and he shook himself as at other times, but he was as weak as any other person. You know, everything had gone away. But you know, if you remain uh, conscious of the Holy Ghost in your life and um, you are prayerful, and you keep on the altar you are consecrated and yielded to the lord and you are very faithful faithful in small things and faithful in every area of your life listen to me faithful to your wife faithful to your husband faithful to the pastor faithful to god faithful to the children of god faithful in the little things you are told to do in the church and faithful in your office you are not a thief and the, the money of the church is not you know sticking in, uh, sticking on your hand you are a clean person, honest person. You know what? You remain full of the Holy Ghost. You will be praying and when the Lord is telling you uh, to, uh, to shed off, uh, you know, some food, you are doing that as well. Uh, but you, you cannot be full of uh, minerals and orange and food and gari and rice and full of the Holy Ghost at the same time. You say, I don't understand. Write it down. Think about it. You will understand. You know, if you, every time you are, your mouth is always eating, always chewing something. If you are not chewing, chewing gum, you are chewing, uh, you are chewing bread. If you are not chewing bread, you are chewing, uh, you know, uh, granules. Always you are either drinking something or chewing something. And, uh, you know, all the time, always eating, always eating. You cannot be full of gari and rice and, uh, and uh, beans and onion and pepper and oil and, and every, all these things and be full of the Holy Ghost at the same time. I'm saying to you something. There are times, if you want to remain full of the Holy Ghost, there are times in your life you'll need to pray and fast. And you know, in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, when in its excess, but be filled with the Spirit. But you know, there is no full stop there. It continues. If you are full of the Spirit, what will follow? This is the evidence. You will be speaking to yourselves in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs. You will be singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You will be giving thanks always for all things. You see that when you are full of the Holy Ghost, there will be no grumbling, no murmuring. You are always thankful and grateful. Giving thanks always because there is no full stop at the end of verse 19. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no full stop there, but it continues submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then there is a full stop. That means if you are full of the Holy Ghost, all through 19 to 21, verses 19 to 21 will be evident in your life. Now, number four. They were, you know, these were to be men from among you. These were to be men of honest report. And these were to be men full of the Holy Ghost. And not only that, they were to be men full of wisdom. In um, Acts chapter 6, I'm reading verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and uh, wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, please look up at me here. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Many, many years ago, I dedicated myself to the study of the Word of God. And uh, every day, every day, I will spend at least two, three, two, three hours on the Word of God. And um, as I come to the Word of God, I just studied. I go from reference to reference on my knees. And I remember in my university days, 
at 6 o'clock in the evening, my roommate would have gone out to eat and I would just lock the door because I know he'll be in the cafeteria eating from 6 to 7 and after that he's going to be discussing with his friends and he will not come back until about 7.30. And with all that I've read, I had a timetable when I ought to read in the Old Testament, when I ought to read in the New Testament, and when I ought to read in the commentaries explaining the Bible, I, had all, I will study and study the Word of God. And you know, I will kneel down uh, from 6 o'clock in the, in the evening while my roommate will go and eat and I will be studying that Word of God. When I know the cafeteria is about to close and the line will not be long, I will round up and I'll go to the cafeteria to eat. And uh, you know, I was seriously on the Word of God. What did I get? I got knowledge. And I came out of the university and I was leading um, a small group of uh, children in Bible study. Can I tell you something? That Bible study of those little children, they never rose beyond 50 people. I had all the knowledge. You know what I didn't have? I didn't have the wisdom. The knowledge was there. I was full of age. Uh, any verse in the Bible, I could just point at it and I could preach even longer than I can preach now. I could preach for two hours and I will just be going from Bible reference to Bible reference, from passage to passage, and I loaded those people with the references of the Bible. But you know what? They never grew in number. They never grew even spiritually because it's not knowledge alone. And I, I started realizing that later. And I began asking the Lord, Oh Lord, what is wisdom? You know some people don't know what wisdom is. Let me show you what wisdom is. There is a difference, as I've told you, between knowledge and wisdom. And a number of us may have knowledge, but if you don't get wisdom, we say it, you know, it will not work. In Proverbs, I'm reading chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, the first part of verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. That's wisdom. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. And if, if you're looking for wisdom, you're looking for how to apply the knowledge you have. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, If the iron be blunt and it do not wet the edge, then it must put to more stress. But wisdom is profitable to direct. You know, after you have had the knowledge, it is the wisdom of God that will direct you, that will show you how to apply that knowledge. And they were looking for men, not just men that were full of knowledge, full of Bible references, who did not have the wisdom of God. But they wanted we men that were full, full of the wisdom of God. Now, this was not natural wisdom, because there is natural wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 6. Let me read from verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. You know, there are those who have man's wisdom. You, you don't organize the church with the wisdom of man. It will never work. Uh, you don't, uh, uh, you know, some people, they say they have uh, sagacity. They are just, uh, they have just the, the, the natural wisdom that people normally have. The one they have read, read off in textbooks and uh, they turn their heads to one side and they tell you that, well, if this happens, this is how to handle that. That's just natural. Acquired wisdom. But you know, here they were looking for uh, something spiritual. And Paul the Apostle was saying that he never allowed natural man's wisdom to affect him whenever he was doing something in the church. And in verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. After he had said that he didn't operate with natural wisdom, then he continued in verse 6, how be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to know, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the heathen wisdom, which God ordained before the foundation, before the world, unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, 
For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so you can see the, the requirements and um, come back to Acts chapter 6. Let me ask you this question. Have you got that, those qualifications? Men from among us, men of honest report, men full of the Holy Ghost, and men full of wisdom. But let me tell you this. Don't be discouraged. What you are not today, you can be tomorrow. Because, you know, a man may seem foolish today. A man may not even be able to operate in, the, in, the, in spiritual wisdom. A man may not be able to operate in the things of the Lord today. But if you'll be patient and you'll be prayerful and you'll diligently study the word of God, I believe that what you don't have today, you can have tomorrow in Jesus' name. So I'm not teaching you... I'm not teaching you all this to condemn you. I'm not teaching you all this to tell you that you can never change and you can never be useful. You know, I have to be faithful as I teach you the word of God. Even though it sometimes may pinch you and, um, you know, make you feel inconvenient. But if I didn't tell you, you will not know how to studiously and prayerfully go to the Lord. So that's why I've revealed all this to you. It's not to discourage you and just to condemn you. I'm telling you that all these things are necessary. And as you wait upon the Lord and believe in the Lord will give unto you in Jesus' name. Now we didn't start on time because we were deliberately waiting for uh, those who were delayed by the ghost law in town. So I'll be finishing in a few minutes. Now I told you about the reasons, I told you about the requirements, and I'm telling you now about the roster. Who are the people on the roster? Let's look at verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose, now this is the roster, these were the people that the church found suitable. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. Listen to me. Can you see there was no autonomy and there was no independence? Even though we talk about a uh, division of labor, we talk about organization in the church, and they chose all these people. They still brought them to the apostles, that the apostles will approve them, and anoint them, and lay hands on them, and accept them. Uh, you see, uh, it's true that we have various areas. We have ushers, we have members of the choir, we have um, full-time workers, and we have uh, house fellowship leaders, various workers in the church. But there is no autonomy, there is no independence. There is no guru that is, you know, running about in isolation, doing what he likes on his, own, on his own, without getting direction, without getting instruction from anybody. But, you know, they chose the seven men. According to these qualifications, and by the way, who gave the qualifications? Those very apostles. And then they told the congregation, now, you have the chance of choosing them. And when you choose them, you bring them to us to see if we can approve, accept, anoint, and, uh, you know, just appoint them. And so in verse 6, whom they search before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Now, as they did this, they say administration was the result. You know, if we have proper biblical administration in the church, the church will grow. The church will enter into a dynamic type of ministry because of the proper organization, because of the adjustment in the administration. Now we've seen the reasons for this administration, we've seen the requirement, we've seen the roster. What's the result? The result is just fantastic. Look at verse 7. And the word of God increased. What does that mean? More and more people had the privilege of hearing the word of God because now the administration was tidied up. Many more workers uh, got into position to, to handle the new areas of the work and, uh, you know, as uh, they, they started to do their work, the apostles had more chance and more time to concentrate on the ministration of the word and in the things of the spirit. And these seven newly chosen men, they were just fantastic. The distribution was going on, no gossiping anymore, no complaint anymore. The distribution was perfectly done, that there was no more money anymore. And the spirit of God began to flow once again. And we're so that the word of God increased. That's number one. Number two, the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. The next word is greatly. 
You know, the, the disciples just multiplied, multiplied, multiplied. And then, number three, so far in the Acts of Apostles, what I'm going to read to you now is, a very, is the greatest miracle that has ever taken place. And a great company of the priests, of the priests, were obedient to the faith. Uh, you know, that has been the greatest miracle of all since this time. Those who were enemies of the gospel before, a great number of them, with better administration, with better organization, a great number of the priests also believed and they were obedient to the faith. You have learned something tonight. When the church has better organization, better administration, the church will grow more. Rise up and let us pray. What do you fit in in all that we've been saying? Are you surrendering yourself to the use of the Lord in the church? Or do you prefer to be a secret disciple, isolated disciple, autonomous disciple, independent disciple, doing his own thing in his own way, without any link with the body of Christ? And you know, the Bible doesn't accept that. The Bible doesn't accept that. And if you are going to be biblical, then you come into biblical church administration and organization. And let the Lord lay his hand upon you and use you. And if you find that you are not qualified today, why not wait upon the Lord and become more qualified? More qualified to serve the Lord and to serve the body of Christ. 